Balancing is one of the aspects of engine building that we get a lot of questions about and I think there's generally a lack of understanding about what actually is involved with balancing the components. And when we think about a factory engine, there will be some level of balance built in by the manufacturer. However, for our purposes for building performance engines or race engines, often we want to work within finer tolerances in terms of our allowable imbalance between all of the components compared to what an OE manufacturer works with. And there's several aspects to consider when it comes to balancing our engine components. Some of these aspects we can do in our home workshop and other aspects require some specialist equipment and really need to be left to your engine machinist. Let's start by talking about the different types of engine though because the type of engine you're dealing with will affect the way the components are balanced. For example, if we've got an inline four or inline six cylinder engine, or for that matter, a horizontally opposed four cylinder or six cylinder, the operation of the piston and rod assemblies means that the weight of the piston and rods actually cancels each other out. In this situation, we can have our machinist balance the crankshaft, the front pulleys, as well as our flywheel and clutch assembly independently of the con rods and the pistons. The con rods and the pistons, of course, do need to be balanced as well. Well, but those actually don't come into account when we're considering the balance of the crankshaft. On the other hand, if we are dealing with a V configuration engine such as a V6 or a V8, in this situation it's quite different and the con rod and piston mass actually needs to be taken into account when the crankshaft is balanced. In this way the engine machinist is going to perform a calculation to come up with what is referred to as a bob weight. That bob weight takes into account the weight of the connecting rod, the weight of the piston, the ring assembly and also a calculation to allow for the oil that's inevitably going to end up clinging to the piston. Once this bob weight is calculated, a physical mass is then attached to the crankshaft while the crankshaft is being spun up in the balancer and balanced. So this brings us to a bit of a tricky situation, particularly if you are balancing a V configuration engine like our LS V8 crankshaft here. If we want to balance our pistons and rods at home in the home workshop, we need to make sure that this work is done before before we send all of our parts off to our machinist. Otherwise if we balance them once they come back that's going to affect the overall balance of the engine. So there's a few things to consider here. Now the next obvious question is how do we go about balancing our components? Well let's start by talking about our pistons because these are relatively straightforward. In order to balance our pistons we're going to need to start with a quality set of digital scales like the ones I've got here. It's important when we are choosing scales for this purpose to make sure that they'll read down to a tenth of a gram. This gives us a good level of precision when we are balancing our piston set. The process from there is is to take all of the pistons in our set and simply weigh our pistons and what we're looking for is the lightest piston in our set. Of course the process from there is to remove weight from the heavier pistons until we've matched them all to within whatever tolerance we like to work with. Now when it comes to balancing our pistons it's not just the piston mass that we're considering here. Of course we really want to match the entire mass of the piston, the wrist pin, the locks for the wrist pin as well as our ring set. Fortunately we're normally going to find that our ring set and our wrist pin locks are going to be fairly consistent across the full set. However we're likely to also see some variation in the weight of the wrist pins. Now there's various ways we can go about this. What we can do is measure all of our pistons, weigh them and then also weigh all of our wrist pins and then by mixing and matching the heaviest wrist pins with the lightest pistons this can get us closer to our overall balance before we actually need to go and do any work to remove material from the pistons. However there's still going to be some level of work required and the next question is how are we going to make this adjustment to our pistons. What we're going to do here is use a ear powered die grinder and we're going to remove material from the underside of the piston skirt working slowly away checking our progress until we get down to our desired tolerance. 
Now, one of the questions we quite often get asked is where should we remove material from our pistons? Obviously, we're going to need to remove material from the piston in order to balance them, but we don't want to risk weakening the piston or damaging the piston while we're doing this. Now, this requires a little bit of an understanding of the piston design, a little bit of understanding on where the piston needs material in order to maintain strength and also generally just a little bit of common sense. Now if we look at this particular piston design from Diamond Race Pistons, we can see that the, the areas that I would be removing material are from the inside of the skirt here. And what we can do is use our die grinder to just gent gently chamfer the edges that I'm running my pointer across here. And we want to do this on both sides of the piston, making sure that we remove as little material as we need to as evenly as we can across the entire skirt diameter. Now the reason we're going to do this is it means we're not focusing our die grinder in one particular area, removing excess material. We're just trying to remove a small amount of material evenly from right the way around the skirt. Because the aluminium material that the piston is made out of is relatively low density and hence quite light, we may need to remove quite a lot of material in order to have an effect on the weight of the piston. This is really a situation where where we want to make small changes and check our progress on the scales frequently. Areas we want to stay away from making any changes to are anywhere on the crown of the piston. We also don't want to do any changes to the skirt of the piston or the ring lands of the piston. All of our work is going to be focused solely on the inside of the piston skirt. We also want to be careful when we are doing this to make sure that if we are removing material from around the pin boss, we want to make sure that we're removing that material in such a way that it's not going to weaken that pin boss and result in a potential for failure there. So in this way balancing our piston set is relatively straightforward and it's something that can be done with a minimum of tools. When it comes to our connecting rods though this is a little bit different. With our connecting rods it's not just a case of measuring the weight of all of our rods, finding the lightest one and then removing material from the heavier rods. Because of the way the con rod operates inside of the engine, part of the mass of the connecting rod is considered to be rotating and part of the weight is considered to be reciprocating. So this makes it a little tricky for us because what we actually need to do is separate out the mass of the big end of the connecting rod and the mass of the small end. What we're trying to do therefore is make sure that across our full set of rods all of the big end weights are equal and we're also going to try and make sure that all of the small end weights are equal. In this way we're going to have a properly balanced set of rods and this is going to require a conrod balancing fixture like the one we've got here. Now what this does is as we can see it supports the connecting rod here on a little fixture that has a ball bearing fitted to it. The other end of the conrod balancing fixture rotates again on uh, ball bearings to give it very low amounts of friction. We then set this up on our scales and this allows us to go through and weigh in this case just the big ends of the connecting rods. So what we're going to try and do here is weigh all of the big ends of our sets of rods, find the lightest and then remove material from just the big ends of the, the rods that are heavier. Now again just like our pistons we want to be mindful of where we are removing this material, again we don't want to weaken the connecting rods and this requires a little bit of consideration about the connecting rod design. Now, one of the areas I quite often see material removed from the big end of the connecting rod is across these two ridges here on the big end cap. Now that's actually the last place we want to remove material even though it's an easy way to remove that material and get our balance right. The the reason is that those ridges are important to the rigidity of the conrod cap. So when we remove material from those ridges, it affects that rigidity, can allow the cap to flex, and particularly in high power, high RPM applications, this can potentially be damaging to the rod and result in a failure. Instead, what we want to do is remove material from the sides of the rod here, down through the sides of the rod bolt. So we can generally put a nice 
chamfer on these areas of the rod without affecting the reliability or strength of the rod. Again, a little bit of common sense is required here to make sure that we're not removing excess material. In order to remove that material, instead of using a die grinder, what we're going to do is use a linisher. And this uses essentially a sanding belt that allows us to smoothly remove material while giving a nice surface finish on the connecting rod. So once we've gone through and we've balanced all of our connecting rod big ends, we then need to go through and weigh the overall rods. Now again we're likely to find that there will be an imbalance this time because we know that all of the big ends of the rods weigh the same. We know that any remaining imbalance is a result of the small end or wrist pin end of the rod. So of course here we're going to again find our lightest rod and remove material from the small end of the remaining rods that are heavier. This again needs to be treated carefully, we don't want to remove excess material because this also could result in a failure weakening the rod. So here what we're going to do is use our linisher and we're going to run our linisher smoothly around the outside diameter of our pin boss on our connecting rod. And we can actually see there is a small amount of linishing that is obvious on this particular connecting rod. So when we are using the linisher to do this we want to smoothly move the rod around the linisher making sure that we're removing material equally right the way around the circumference of the small end of the rod. That's the way we're going to remove that material without excessively weakening the rod. Another aspect when we are doing this it's really important to not overheat the material of the rod. If you hold the rod on the linisher for too long you're going to overheat the rod you'll end up seeing the steel material of the connecting rod end up turning blue so we want to avoid that. So it's a case of making small adjustments smoothly on our linisher and again constantly checking our work on our scales. Once we've got our piston set and our connecting rod set properly balanced to within whatever tolerances we're trying to work with this is the time to hand the components over to our engine machinist and they can finish off the balancing tasks with the rotating assembly in terms of the crankshaft. As I mentioned if we're dealing with an inline engine then the machinist isn't going to need to consider the weight of the conrods and pistons, however with a V configuration engine with your new, newly balanced conrods and pistons the machinist is going to be able to take a weight off those components to calculate the bob weight. When it comes to balancing the rotating assembly in terms of the crankshaft what the machinist will do is start with just the crankshaft in their balancing machine and that will be balanced to whatever tolerance they're working with. Now this is a case where the machinist will often need to drill into the counterweights of the crankshaft in order to remove material. On the other hand in some instances the crankshaft may actually need weight put back into it. Now this might sound a little bit tricky and it definitely can add to the expense of your balancing but it is possible. How this is done is that holes are drilled horizontally through the counterweights of the crankshaft and special heavy material or heavy metals such as mallory are added into the crankshaft counterweights. Once the crankshaft itself has been balanced then the machinist will add the front pulley or damper assembly and then repeat the process. So what this does is it allows each of the components to be balanced individually, meaning that at a later point if the damper needs to be replaced we don't need to disassemble the entire engine in order to have the crankshaft rebalanced, it's simply a case of sending the new front damper to your machinist, they can balance that on its own and we can fit it to the crankshaft. Likewise the same exact situation goes with your flywheel and clutch assembly that can be balanced independent of the crankshaft itself. While a correctly balanced engine isn't necessarily going to show you more power when it it comes time to hit the dyno what you're going to end up with is an engine that's much smoother in operation and this can actually pan out as improved reliability and life expectancy out of the components inside of your engine. Now while balancing is important we also need to consider the damper or harmonic balancer that's fitted to the crankshaft snout. So I've got one here which is a aftermarket replacement component for a GM LS1. Now a lot of people 
think that if we go to the trouble of correctly balancing the internal components of the engine then we don't need one of these harmonic dampeners and we see a lot of people fit small diameter aluminium front pulleys instead which have no ability to reduce the vibrations inside of the engine components. Uh, this in my opinion is very dangerous and we need to understand how the engine operates and why we still need a harmonic dampener in place. Regardless of how well balanced the engine components are, what's happening is that when the engine is operating and a combustion event occurs, that puts a pulse of energy through the piston down into the connecting rod and then that gets transferred into the crankshaft journal. Now what this essentially does is creates a torsional twist in the crankshaft obviously only a very small twist and while our crankshaft when it's sitting here on the workbench might look and feel like it's very very rigid it actually acts a little bit like a very very stiff spring. We've obviously got combustion events happening continuously while the engine is running so the crankshaft is constantly being exposed to these torsional twisting forces. Now this is what the harmonic dampener is designed to remove it's designed to dampen out those vibrations that exist in the crankshaft and if we remove one of these harmonic dampeners and replace it with a solid aluminium pulley then there's no way of dampening out those vibrations. Now at some particular RPM ranges those vibrations can become very damaging to our engine components. As we move through the RPM range there will be certain RPMs where a resonant frequency is reached and at those resonant frequencies we essentially see the vibrations magnify and particularly if we sit at those RPM ranges for an extended period of time this can cause a huge amount of damage to our engine components. One of the most common failures we see with this is a situation where we have an oil pump that's driven directly off the crankshaft and we often see those oil pump gears shattered as a result of those resonant frequencies. So it's really important to maintain a good quality harmonic dampener when you are building any engine either a street engine or a race engine and often and the factory harmonic dampeners or balancers aren't going to be sufficient, particularly in some motorsports drag racing is a good example, you actually may require an SCFI rated dampener. Now this is a dampener that is designed so that it can't come apart in operation and obviously if the dampener comes apart at high RPM this could end up doing a lot of damage to your car as well as potentially you or other spectators. In this case there are companies such as Fluid Damper and ATI just to name a couple who make aftermarket SFI rated dampers for different engines. As an added bonus some of these aftermarket dampers will have timing marks engraved onto the outside edge of the damper making it much easier to time up your engine. So if you're hoping to gain a little bit of power by fitting a solid aluminium front pulley to underdrive some of the accessories such as your alternator just consider that there are some pretty big downsides to doing so and it's always a good idea to fit a quality harmonic dampener to any engine. So this brings us to the end of our second lesson and at this point we've got our pistons and connecting rods ready to send out to our machinist for machining. In in our next lesson, the third of four, we're going to have a look at the steps you should be taking once you get your engine block back from your machinist and get it onto the engine stand. If you like that video, make sure you give it a thumbs up and if you're not already a subscriber, make sure you're subscribed. We release a new video every week. And if you like free stuff, we've got a great deal for you. Click the link in the description to claim your free spot to our next live lesson.